Y'all back at it once again. It's a cold skill fun day. Spend that knowledge for you and for yours. You know what I'm saying? And um, first of all, I gotta give a shout out to my ancestors for giving me the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And second of all, I give a shout out to y'all. You know what I'm saying? The subscriber and the watchers out there. The channel been blowing up. Much love to all y'all. And this one right here is from the Business Insider. <clears throat> Excuse me. And why the Nazis studied American race laws for inspiration. This is an article, like I said, from the Business Insider, February 19, 2017. On June 5th, on the 5th of June, 1934, about a year and a half after Adolf Hitler came Chancellor of the Reich, the leading lawyers in Nazi Germany gathered for a meeting to plan what would become the Nuremberg Laws, the center anti-Jewish legislation of the Nazi regime, race regime. The meeting was an important one, and a stenographer was present to take down a verbatim transcript to preserve by the ever-diligent Nazi bureaucracy as a record of a crucial moment in the creation of a new race regime. The transcript reveals a stuttering fact. The meeting involved a lengthy discussion of the law of the United States of America. At its very opening, the Minister of Justice presented a memorandum on U.S. race law, and as the meeting progressed, the positions turned to the U.S. as an example repeatedly. They debated whether they should bring Jim Crow segregation to the Third Reich. They engaged in detailed discussions of statutes from 30 U.S. states that had criminalized racially mixed marriages. They reviewed how the various U.S. states determined who counted as a Negro or a Mongro and weighed whether it should be adopted U.S. techniques in their own approach to determining who counted as a Jew. Throughout the meeting, the most ardent supporters of the U.S. model were the most radical Nazis in the room. The record of that meeting is only one piece of evidence in an unexamined history that is sure to make Americans cringe. Throughout the early 1930s, the early years of the making of the Nuremberg Laws, Nazi policy makers looked to the U.S. law for inspiration. Hitler himself, in Mein Kampf, described the U.S. as the one state that made progress to the creation of a healthy racist society, and after the Nazi seized power in 1933, they continued to cite and ponder the U.S. models regularly. They saw many things to despise in the U.S. constitutional values, to be sure, but they also saw many things to admire in the U.S. white supremacy. And when the Nuremberg Laws were being promulgated in 1935, it almost certainly the case they was reflected the direct U.S. influence. This story might seem incredible. Why was the Nazis that felt the need to take lessons in racism from anybody else? Why, most especially, would they look to the U.S.? Whatever is failing, after all, the U.S. is the home of a great liberal and democracy, democratic tradition. Moreover, the Jews in the U.S., however many obstacles they might have confronted in the early 20th century, never faced state-sponsored persecution. And in the end, America made immense sacrifices in the struggle to defeat Hitler. But the reality is that in the early 20th century, the U.S., with its vigorous and creative legal culture, led the world in racist making, racist lawmaking. That it was not the only, that was not the only other true Jim Crow South. It was true on a national level as well. The U.S. had a race-based immigration law admired by racists all over the world, and the Nazis, like their right-wing European successors of the day, and so many U.S. Mm -hmm. voters. Like the right wing Nazis, Nazis like the right wing European successor today, and so many U.S. voters were obsessed with the dangers posed by immigration. The U.S. stood alone in a world where harshness of anti masculinity laws, which not only prohibited racially mixed marriages, but also threatened racially mixed couples with severe criminal punishment. Again, this law was not confined to the South. It was found all over the U.S. Nazi lawyers carefully studied the statutes, not only the statutes of such states as Virginia, but also such states as Montana. It is true that the United States did not perse persecute the Jews, or at least as one Nazi lawyer remarked in 1936, it had not persecuted the Jews so far, and had reached created a host of second-class citizenships for other minority groups, including the Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, Puerto Ricans, and Native Americans scattered over the Union and its colonies. 
American forms of second class citizenship were of great interest to the Nazis policymakers as they set up the crowd their own forms of second class citizenship for German Jewelry. Not at least, the U.S. is the greatest economical and cultural power in the world after 1918. Dynamic, modern, wealthy, Hitler and all other Nazis envied the U.S. and wanted to learn how, learn how the Americans did it. It was to no great surprise they believed that what had made American great was American racism. Of course, however, ugly American race law might have been there was no American model for the Nazi extermination camps, even if the Nazis expressed their admiration for American conquest of the West. When, as Hitler declared, the settlers had shot down millions of redskins to a few hundred thousand. In any case, extermination camps were not the issue during the early part of the 1930s. When the Nuremberg laws were framed, the Nazis were not yet contemplating mass murder. Their aim at the time was to compel the Jews by whatever means possible to flee Germany in order to preserve the Third Reich as a pure Aryan country. And here, they indeed convinced that they can identify the American role models and some strange American heroes. For a young Nazi lawyer named Heinrich Kiergen, for example, who had studied at the University of Arkansas as exchange students and whose diligent research on U.S. race law formed the basis of the work of the Nazi Ministry of Justice, the great American heroes were Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. Did not Jefferson say in 1821 that it was certain that two races equally free cannot live in the same government? Did not Lincoln often declare before 1864 that the only real hope for America lay in the resettlement of a black population somewhere else? For a Nazi who believed that Germany's only hope lay in the forced immigration of Jews, these can seem like shining examples. None of this is entirely easy to talk about. It is hard to overcome our sense that we, if we influence the Nazism and we have polluted ourselves in a way that can never be cleansed. Nevertheless, the evidence is there and we cannot read about it without either German or American history. Um, I want to discredit this article on one sense that about the um, concentration camps. There was concentration camps all throughout the Americas. You can just look at the Devil Punch Bowl, um, Parchment Prison, that's a concentration camp. Really, all the prisons and stuff like that was concentration camps during the convict leasing laws they had us under. You know what I'm saying? Where it definitely work set black people free and they had them digging in the coal mines um, for criminal acts. You know what I'm saying? The criminal, criminal justice system, which itself, unto itself, is the concentration system that, you know, that the Americans had set up over here. You know what I'm saying? But this tell you right here that um, the Nazis took everything from the concentration system to the Nuremberg Laws. They took everything here from the United States of America. And we know that was all against black folks. Anyway, much love to you and yours. Just trying to get this information on out here. So if that's the case, what's the difference between Nazi Germany and America? And the difference is what Malcolm X said. You know what I'm saying? Malcolm, you know, he said he said set us to use a Nazi Germany, he used South Africa. South Africa practice apart speak apartheid and they practice apartheid. Same thing with the Germans here. The Germans speak, you know, going against the Jews and they practice going against the Jews. While the Americans speak they don't do that stuff, but in actuality, they do. And that's the big difference. Uh much love to you and yours. Subscribe to the channel. Have a good one. Hope you learn something. Peace.